Hi folks, uh, welcome to our presentation about AirGap. We want to give you in the following minutes a short overview of uh, AirGap. What is uh, meant and why it isn't so complicated as many think about. So let's talk about uh, the agenda. First, a short intro who we are. Then we will discuss a standard uh, Kate's environment. After that, we come along to the question, uh, what is AirGap? And we will show you some important topics about. Next, uh, Vincent will give us a, a short demonstration and uh, coming to the end uh, with a conclusion. So let's uh, us move uh, to who we are. We are from uh, CubeOps, a company that has been working uh, with microservices and Kubernetes for several years. Our portfolio includes uh, training, workshops, and uh, project support for the installation and the operation of uh, Kubernetes. Furthermore, uh, we are the producer of a Kubernetes distribution for productive environments. You can find our software products on our website, uh, cubeops.net. So we are, like you see here on the slide on the left, uh, Tobias uh, working as a DevOps engineer. In the middle, myself uh, working as a Kubernetes trainer. And on the uh, right side, Vincent working as a developer. OK, so let's talk about uh, Kubernetes. I want to start with this uh, funny quote of a user. He said, uh, I barely understand my own feelings. How am I supposed to understand Kubernetes? Kubernetes is not a flash in the pan. It is here to stay and its prevalence. In the next minutes, I want to give you a short overview about some topics on the Kubernetes and AirGapped environment. However, organizations in finance, healthcare, public sector agencies, and other highly regulated industries have added security and compliance requirements. In these cases, there is a need to balance the advantage of high, highly availability, scalable, and redundant Kubernetes cloud-based environments with additional infrastructure restrictions such as no public internet access or high security standards. Cloud native does not mean cloud bound. Increasingly, companies are seeking to take advantage of, uh, of these cloud native features in their own secure data centers. While challenging to implement, it's not impossible. Building an isolated Kubernetes environment starts with the infrastructure and dependency planning. So the knowledge you'll need for an on-premise deployment is a, a viable option for air gap Kubernetes deployments is to develop a homegrown uh, solution. This approach will require specific planning and expertise. So you see here in this picture, an example of a typical uh, standard implementation of a Kubernetes cluster. Every node or pod can uh, connect to the internet. To prioritize your goals, try to understand the potential of Kubernetes and imagine how your company might be using it in five years. Kubernetes is a great way to run modern microservice uh, centric applications. Images are often downloaded directly from the internet sources and used in the production environment without further verification. It cannot be verified that the creator of the image has processed in it. This means that unwanted additional data may have been processed in the image. Images should be rebuilt in a controlled environment as much as possible. Each step uh, in the building the image should be controlled and scrutinized with a focus on security. Artifacts, any files in the images, like uh, images themselves, 
are of unknown origin. It is not possible to control how the artifacts were created and what they contain. Okay, so just want to give some facts about Kubernetes. These facts come from a survey from Canonical uh, published by Forbes. Kubernetes implementations are growing every year with more and more machines. The biggest challenge in the CD CI area is the lack of educated manpower. Kubernetes is not a Windows, simple Windows 11 installation. Another problem is the ne negligence of uh, Kubernetes updates. A lot of IT guys are implementing uh, Kubernetes uh, without a concrete plan how to update Kates uh, regularly. Many pros in the meantime uh, know what you can do with namespaces, isolate apps and make Kubernetes more secure. Interesting is that only the half of the respondents are running a high availability Kubernetes cluster. So what do the other nearly 45% do? That's a good question. This shows you a scan of a package at uh, Docker Hub. Only in this image, it were 148 vulnerabilities found. Misconfiguration is the most common security incident. Users are too trustworthy and uh, should rather be a bit more critical in the area. In order to locate and uh, to share Docker container images, Docker is offering a, a service called Docker Hub. Its main feature, repositories, allows the development community to push and pull the container images. So with Docker Hub, anyone in the world can download and execute any public image as it was a standalone application. Today, Docker Hub accounts over 4 million public Docker container images. With 8 billion pools, means downloads in January 2020 and growing. Its analyzed image pools should uh, top over 100 billion this year. Whoa, what a big number. When you develop uh, a lot of images yourself, you need to uh, have a good base image to rely on. The base image should be small, capable and secure. Now, what is a base image? A base image is the image that is used to create all of your container images. Your base image can be, for example, an official Docker image, such as uh, CentOS, or you can modify an official Docker image uh, to suit your needs. Or you can create your own base image from scratch. Container images are built uh, by applying layers onto previous images. Each file system layers represent a point in time record of the file system state after certain actions. Images that have a common ancestry file system layers, allowing for reduced overhead uh, and greater consistency between images. So that means minimize attack surface and uh, it's called what's not included can't break. That's one of the most important rules uh, for a base image. Make sure that only that software uh, is included, which is actually neat. And as a consequence of this, make sure that you really know what, uh, or which software is included and how it is working. For checking the images, you can use, for example, Quay.io security scanner, uh, part of the uh, Quay container image uh, registry. And most potentially harmful container images are coin miners. There's over 44% uh, of the containers. Okay, so let me talk about something uh, about Kubernetes security. So first, 
enable Kubernetes uh, RBAC, or called uh, Kubernetes Role-Based Access Control. RBAC can uh, help you define who has access to Kubernetes API and what permissions they have. RBAC is uh, usually uh, enabled uh, by default, but uh, when you uh, use RBAC uh, or when you enable RBAC, you must also disable the legacy uh, attribute based access control called ABAC. Second, use a third uh, party authentication uh, for API server. It is highly recommended to integrate Kubernetes with a third party authentication provider, for example, GitHub. This provides additional security features such as uh, multi factor authentication and ensures that the uh, Kube API server uh, does not change when, uh, for example, users are added or removed. If uh, possible, make sure that the users are not managed uh, at the a, uh, API server level. So next one is uh, use uh, process whitelisting. Process whitelisting is an effective way to identify unexpected running processes. First, observe the application over a period of time to identify all processes running uh, during normal application behavior. Then use this list as your whitelist uh, for future application behavior. So first, turn on uh, audit logging. Make sure that audit logging is enabled and that you are monitoring unusual or unwanted API calls, especially authentication failures. These log entries display a so-called forbidden status message. Failure to authorize could mean that an attacker is trying to use stolen credentials. Next one is also important. That means uh, keep Kubernetes uh, version up to date. You should always run the latest version of uh, Kubernetes. So always plan to upgrade your Kubernetes version to the latest. Upgrading Kubernetes can be a complex process because uh, you get uh, three or four times uh, per year uh, some new up uh, upgrades from uh, Kubernetes. And uh, next one or the last one here is uh, yeah, lockdown uh, kubelet. What is kubelet? Kubelet is an agent running on each um, node which interacts with the container runtime to launch pods and report metrics for nodes and uh, pods. Each kubelet uh, in the cluster exposes an API which you can uh, use to start and stop pods and perform other uh, operations. It, or if an unauthorized user uh, gains access to this API or on any node and can run uh, code on the cluster, they can compromise the entire cluster. Okay, the kube config, kubelet config, and the kube ADM config contain important uh, information about the cluster. Besides information gathering, modifying these uh, configs can cripple the cluster. By default, the following directories contain uh, important information. These directories are only relevant for troubleshooting. Therefore, there should not be no access rights for non-admin users for this path. Since all paths are immediately visible with the uh, system CTL cat uh, kubelet, system CTL should be only uh, yeah, possible for admins in, uh, in the cluster. Some platforms uh, will go so far as uh, to evaluate uh, clusters or your cluster against uh, CIS called the Center for Internet Security uh, Benchmarks for Kubernetes uh, Security. Here uh, you see the, the link uh, to, to that uh, stuff. In addition to the platform uh, level security, there is a rich ecosystem of organizations 
that uh, focus on container security uh, specifically, such as uh, Aqua security, twist lock, uh, stack rocks, and uh, Neue Vector. So let me show you an example on the called security concept whitelisting. This concept deals with a restrictive approach, so called whitelisting. The goal here is to close all contact points called uh, deny all and to enable only explicitly uh, desired or permitted actions. Depending on the criticality, this can be passed uh, on onto other departments, so called segregation of duty and may have to be checked from a, a security perspective. For this purpose, a process can be established for requesting certain resources or activations. Kubernetes offers uh, many levers uh, for securing the cluster or cluster operations. And uh, most of the security settings are not focused on maximum security, but are designed for fast deployment and uh, use. So the rule of thumb here is an insecure container can be intercepted by a secure cluster. But however, the reverse does not apply. All right, uh, now that we have an overview of the Kubernetes environment and Kubernetes security, let's move on to the question, what is an air gap environment? Um, the term air gap means the complete isolation of a device or system from the internet. Air gap networks and computers are used when the highest level of security must be provided for the system or the data stored within it. The air gap protects the system from malware, key loggers, ransomware, or other unwanted access. In a Kubernetes air gap environment, internet connectivity is severely limited by a firewall. The cluster has very limited access to software repositories or registries. Um, a common solution is to whitelist access to software repositories or registries with an outbound proxy and keep all the other connections closed. In this way, the cluster is cut off from the outside world. In an air gap Kubernetes cluster, you cannot reach control plane endpoints over the internet. And in a, in a security environment, a technical user uh, is used instead of a root user. This user has restricted rights on the operating system. Yeah, uh, running Kubernetes in offline air gapped environments uh, means having private registries and repositories in place for Kubernetes, uh, Docker, and all of the open source components an organization needs to run Kubernetes in production. It will need to configure all of its Docker images to pull from its internal registries and repositories. And all of its software and open source components will need to be tightly integrated, secured, tested for vulnerabilities, and made locally accessible to its application and deployment environments. Yeah, here's a list of common problems that occur in daily business. You want to install Kubernetes, but don't have access to YAM. You also do not have to uh, require sudo permissions. There are also restrictions on the permissions uh, for certain directories. These directories are only relevant for troubleshooting. Therefore, there should be no access rights for non-admin users for these paths. One practical example, a specific Kubernetes version is not compatible with an upgraded version of IP tables. Yeah, in order to downgrade to an older version, Specific YAM commands are required, which must be first uh, uh, enabled to install a specific IP tables version. Another example there is a request uh, needed to access the registry through the outgoing proxy so that we can retrieve all the images needed for the cluster and the application. One last practical example, you want to migrate your storage solution from NFS to Longhorn. So the disks need to be mounted and integrated into Longhorn. This requires many sudo commands, but they have to be enabled first. Yeah, let's move on to the pros and cons of an air gap and security environment. In an air gap and security environment, 
the advantages in terms of security most likely go hand in hand with the disadvantages in terms of productivity. While the limited uh, internet connectivity may protect you from downloading malicious data or certain uh, third party attacks, on the other hand, you may lose productivity and aspects and the effort and cost of deploying and maintaining your cluster may increase. Not only does offline installation enhance complexity during installation, but also cluster management operations, such uh, uh, machine maintenance, disaster recovery, upgrading to newer versions, applying security patches and more. Ultimately, you will never be 100% secure with an air gap only environment. For example, threats from within are still possible. Let's look at a typical example of a daily task. We want to deploy Elasticsearch in Kubernetes cluster with Helm. For any common Helm chart, uh, the process would be the same. Yeah, the installation usually always runs in three <coughs> steps. First, a Kubernetes cluster is needed. Second, we need to install Helm so we can run the curl install script from GitHub and run it on the machine. The problem is that we don't even know what exactly we are running. The third step is the deployment of Elasticsearch. You add the Helm repo, call the values YAML file, and install the Helm chart. This approach can be risky if you are working in a security-oriented production environment. Many Helm charts include images and containers that aren't always necessary or worse. You really don't know which images are even installed or how many critical vulnerabilities they have. Especially in a Kubernetes cluster, you should make your containers as secure as possible to minimize the chance of outside attacks or privilege escalations from the containers. Otherwise, an attacker could take control of your cluster and use it for their own purposes. You know, for example, mining bitcoins. Let's continue with our example. Here, we call the Helm installation script from GitHub in an environment with internet connection. <coughs> and as you can see, it works fine. Then we can run the script and install Helm. In an air gap environment, we already fail because the firewall blocks the URL and we can't <coughs> access GitHub. Let's get to the deployment of Elasticsearch with Helm. You add the Helm repository, call the values YAML file from GitHub, and install the chart. You can see that it works well. However, in an air gap environment, the repositories cannot be accessed. So the chart cannot be installed. Yeah, the same scenario applies to Kibana as well. Now let's move on to the installation of Helm in an air gap environment. Of course, the required commands uh, must be in the sudoers file. So first of all, we need to install Helm in our environment. To do this, we download the Helm binary on a local machine and move it to the technical users directory on the admin node, for example, using SCP. Then we unpack the file and make it executable, as you can see here. Next, we deploy with Helm Elasticsearch. Now that Helm is installed, we download the Helm chart to our local machine and validate it. This means that we check the chart files of unnecessary or unwanted containers and images. To do this, we look through the chart files and find all the images. Then we download the images to our local machine and check them for vulnerabilities. And if necessary, the images are hardened. Then they are signed and transferred to our registry. Next, we change the values file to use the image from our registry, or mostly we will adjust the values yeah, for the cluster as well. Afterwards, the customized Helm chart is transferred to the admin node, for example, with SCP. Now we are ready to deploy the chart with Helm in our cluster. And as you can see, it works. Okay, thank you. Uh... Toby, so let's move then to Vincent. 
You will uh, give us a short uh, demonstration. Thanks, Ralf and Toby. I will show you how to set up an LGAP cluster with a simple proxy server. So, first things first, I show you my setup. This is the admin machine, it's not a direct part of the cluster itself, but it manages it. The cluster contains two nodes, one master node and one worker node. All three nodes have very limited access to the outside world. The only available ports and addresses are the 443 port for HTTPS communication, 6443 and 7443 for the communication inside the cluster, the port 80 for HTTP connection, uh, I already prepared the port 32454 as well, which I will use for the Docker registry. And the addresses available are the hub Kubernetes net, which is the, pa uh, the package manager, the place where all packages are stored, as well as all the machines in the cluster. But that's it. I am ready and my cluster is ready as well for a deployment. So I will deploy a Sina package a registry into my cluster. And all I need to do is call Sina search. Sina search gives me an overview about all the packages available in the hub. As you can see, those are quite a lot of packages. So to filter for the package I want, I can call Sina search minus minus PS and I search for Vincent since I did them on my account. And now there are only a handful of packages available. And the package I want to deploy is the package docker registry in the version 271. In order to install this package, I copy the value in the install row, paste it after the Sina install command and pass a value file, which I will explain later on. Now the package gets downloaded and it will deploy the, uh, the registry into my cluster. Now if you want to know what exactly happens here, I will show you very soon. But I can call, uh, I can tell you this, it's not only a deployment, it's much more. So, the installation is finished. We take a look at the pods. There's the registry pod. If we take a look at the services, there's uh, the service for the registry. Now, keep in mind, I already prepared the pod 32454 and I will show you one thing more. If I curl the catalog by curling local registry, there is already one, uh, one repository containing one image. And I will show you how I did it and how easy it is to create such a Sina package. Now, what you do, uh, what you need to create your very own Sina package is a machine with access to the World Wide Web as well as installed Helm, Docker and Sina. Or short, this machine. This machine is totally clean. It got no images available right now. So um, we start from, yeah, from the very first point. I like to create a folder when I create a Sina package to keep things clean and tidy. Let's call this kubecon. And in this folder, I simply have to type in Sina create, which will create two files. The first file is the package.yaml, which is like a configuration file for the Sina package. And the second file is the template.yaml, which enables us to pass user values through the installation process. But since we want to make a high security deployment, we need all the dependencies available on our machine. Since I used a Helm chart for the Docker registry, the Twoony package, I need to pull this Helm chart first. 
guided on the machine. This machine uses an image, the Docker registry image in the version 271. Now what we already do is docker pull registry in the version 2.71. Okay, it should be available exactly, but since we want to include it into the package itself, we have to store it in a file. We can do this by calling docker save, docker uh, image name and the version, and we define an output file registry.image. Now we have the image as well, and now we have all the dependencies in this folder. So let's take a closer look at the package.yaml. The package.yaml defines our Sina package, as I said before. For example, the name can be set to kubecon registry description registry package. The version is changeable as well. I like to check the version of the image included. In this case, it's 271. Now we have to pass all the files included in the package. We also want the Helm chart included. You can name it whatever you want. I simply like to call it Helm. And the file name is Docker registry and the version is 132. And we can also call the image uh, with the name registry.image. Now we could also take images from an online registry, which we would do in the field containers. But since we operate in a high security cluster, we don't want to uh, any more contact than we need. So we simply delete these lines as well as these in the installation part. The installation part should also include the helm chart and the image, so we list them here as well. And now we come to the most interesting part of Sina, the task list. The tasks get called in their order every time the package gets installed. So if we would call Sina install kubecon registry, it would firstly print start Sina create example. Use the template engine to merge the template.yaml and the given user values into a result.yaml and print again a message. We want to take it one step further, further and create a really cool package. So what we need to do is add some lines. Since we want to deploy a Helm chart, which uses an image, we need to uh, make that image available for our machine. In order to do so, we will call the CMD plugin, which simply executes a command in your shell and call the command docker load registry.image. This will make the image available in our local registry. Next, the template plugin gets called so that we can change the values for the installation of the Helm chart afterwards. After both is done, finally we can install the Helm chart. To do so, we call Helm install. We define which Helm chart should get installed. This is the Docker registry 132. And the values which uh, can change the deployment are passed in the result.yaml. Okay, after this we should have a deployed and up and running registry, but we can connect to it since it, it's got no certificate and we don't have a way to connect to it via HTTPS. So we have to add it um, in the insecure registries file. To do so, we have to edit a file. So we call the edit file plugin. The operation we want to do with that file is we want to override it. The file type we want to override is a text file 
and the file path is slash etc slash docker slash daemon json. We want to overwrite the very first line and the value we want to pass is in secure registries. And the insecure registry is called local registry and the version is two, uh, 32454. Okay, now we are able to reach the registry, so let's use it, push an image to it. What we need to do first is tag the image. To do so, we call the Docker plugin with the option tag. The source image is the image we load here and it's the docker.io slash registry in the version 2.71 and the new image name should be local registry in the version 32.454 slash docker.io slash registry 2.7.1 Okay, in order to push it, we need to give the registry a little bit time to get up. So we call another command, namely the sleep command for 10 seconds, just that the registry gets enough time to get up and get running. And after that, we call once more the Docker plugin, this time with the option push. And we want to push the source image, local registry 32454 slash docker.io slash registry in the version 271. And that's it. Now let's take a closer look at the Docker registry Helm chart. To do so, we simply extract it, go into the folder and take a look at the values.yaml. And right there is a big problem in the service. The service type is cluster IP, which is not ideal since we want to reach it instantly. To do so, we have to change the type to node port and define a node port. And we could do this directly here in the values.yaml of the Helm chart. But there is a better way to do so, there is the Sina way. Again, we take a look at the template.yaml. Here we can define a template which gets merged with user values. Our template should have the same structure as the values.yaml we have to change. So we say we want to change the key service and we want to change the type. And now we give a reference to the user values by saying values.type. And we do the same for the node port. Values.nodePort. Okay, so if we install this Sina package and pass a values.yaml, with uh, the key type and a value and a key node port and a given value, those get placed in right here. Okay, we are ready to go. In order to wrap it up, we simply call Sina build. Sina build takes all the files given and takes them into the package. And in order to share a package, we need to log in. To do so, we say Sina login minus u and the username. And the password. And that's it. Now we take a short look at package.yaml just to make sure. The name is kubecon registry and the version is 271. Okay, so as a last action to share it with the world and everyone, we say Sina push. Now, if you have packages you can share with everyone but want to use Sina, 
don't worry, we also got the opportunity for a private hub for you to use. If you want it, feel free to contact us after this presentation. And that's it, our package is installed, we go back to our cluster. Now what we do first is delete our old deployment. By typing helm delete and the deployment name. So that our cluster is clean again. Also, we remove all images just to prove that we took the images from the Sina package. Okay, and again, we say Sina search, filter for my name. We find the kubecon package in the version 2.7.1 and we say Sina install. But before we just take a look at my values.yaml here, there is the node port given and the type given. Perfect. So Sina install minus f values.yaml. And that's it. Again, we can check the services. It is running on the port 32454. And take a look at the catalog. And there it is, the image. And that's it. That's how easy it is to create an air gap environment with Sina. To share packages to automate everything you want to do. So back to you, Ralph and Toby. Thank you, Vincent, for this great uh, demonstration. So let's move on. <clears throat> One of the latest uh, state uh, of Kubernetes and container security reports by Red Hat found that 24 percent of serious container issues were uh, vulnerabilities that could be remediated. Almost 70 percent were, as we said, uh, misconfigurations and uh, 27 uh, percent were runtime security incidents. So here's an overview of our so-called uh, five level hardening procedure that we are offering uh, to our customers. If you want to get in detail, please visit our website or contact us about air gap band uh, hardening. So now we are coming uh, to the conclusion. <clears throat> Kubernetes in the standard can be fast installed, but please take care. Kubernetes has some open doors and you certainly don't want everyone coming in uh, through those doors. That means a well-designed and a safe security concept is mandatory before you install anything. And ACAP is a really, really tough topic, but it is definitely worth looking into. It depends on who sets if ACAP reduces productivity. ACAP increases the effort and cost but a hacked environment costs more. How much did Log4j cost? Agap protects against malicious data downloads or certain third-party attacks. So now we are uh, at the end uh, of this video uh, on Agap. We would like to thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions about Kubernetes and Agap, don't hesitate uh, to drop us a line or contact uh, us uh, via our social media accounts. We are looking uh, forward to answering uh, your questions. You can also uh, reach us uh, through our website, uh, cubeops.net. Thank you very much and bye-bye.